ID the Future, a podcast about evolution and intelligent design. One of the most incredible features of cellular life is the capability of self-replication. But can a Darwinian mechanism take the credit for the origin and design of the cell division process? Welcome to ID the Future. I'm your host, Andrew McDermott. Well, today, Dr. Jonathan McClatchy joins me as we conclude a four-part series on the intelligent design and irreducible complexity of eukaryotic cell division. Dr. Jonathan McClatchy is a fellow and resident biologist at the Discovery Institute's Center for Science and Culture. He was previously an assistant professor at Sadler College in Boston, where he lectured biology for four years. McClatchy holds a bachelor's degree in forensic biology, a master's degree in evolutionary biology, a second master's in medical and molecular bioscience, and a PhD in evolutionary biology. His research interests include the scientific evidence of design in nature, arguments for the existence of God, and New Testament scholarship. Jonathan is also founder and director of TalkAboutDoubts.com. It's good to have you back, Jonathan. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Well, in this episode, we're capping off a series we've been doing on eukaryotic cell division. You've been studying this remarkable process for about a decade now, and you just published a paper in the free open access journal Biocomplexity titled Phylogenetic Challenges to the Evolutionary Origin of the Eukaryotic Cell Cycle. You've also written a number of articles on the topic at evolutionnews.org on the, on the general subject and zooming into the specific components. Now, for those of you who may have missed the first three episodes we've done on this, let's do a quick review and then you can let us know what we're going to cover today. Now, in part one, we began by reviewing the basics, the differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, the phases of eukaryotic cell division, and the stages of mitosis. Then you discussed how the process exhibits irreducible complexity. Now, I want to make sure everybody's on the same page with that term. Can you remind us what we mean when we say a system uh, exhibits irreducible complexity? Sure. So an irreducibly complex system is where we have a, a complex biological system that is comprised of uh, several well-matched interacting components that, that work together in unison to bring about a higher level objective. And this is a significant challenge to evolutionary processes um, accounting for their origin because um, such systems appear to require foresight to bring about. Natural selection can only preserve those uh, systems which are already serve a selective benefit or utility. Uh, it cannot select for some future function. And so by an unguided search without knowing where the target is, how would you uh, assemble uh, such a system uh, while retaining a selective advantage at every step along the way without passing through any maladaptive intermediate stages. Uh, and so this is a, a significant challenge to evolutionary processes. And it's not only that, but it also supports intelligent design because intelligent agents uniquely are able to uh, visualize these complex higher level objectives and then bring everything together needed to realize those objectives. Um, and so uh, the, the irreducible complex features are not particularly surprising, supposing a mind is involved, we recognize that intelligent agents often produce uh, systems comprised of several well-matched interactive components that each contribute to the uh, system's function. And if you were to remove any one of the parts, the system would cease to work. Um, whereas unguided processes can't uh, do that. And so in view of that top-heavy likelihood ratio, um, it supports a design thesis over a, an unguided uh, process. Yeah, great. And also in that opening episode, we mentioned the natural limitation of the natural selection mechanism. In your paper, you actually quote a Latin expression that Darwin used in his famous book, On the Origin of Species. He used it to describe natural selection. Can you remind us of what that is and what it means? Sure. Uh, so this is the idea that nature does not take uh, sudden leaps. And um, and uh, we uh, Evolution is a, is a process that involves very gradual change over a long period of time uh, through uh, successive incremental stages, uh, whereas what we actually observe in the fossil record and also at the molecular level is are, are these discontinuous jumps, right? We see uh, most notably in the fossil record in the Cambrian explosion, but not limited to the Cambrian explosion. 
Um, and then in biology, uh, there are examples of this as well. And the example that we're talking about here is the jump from the prokaryotic cell to the eukaryotic cell, uh, and in particular, the apparatus involved in cell division uh, in the eukaryotic cell. Yeah. Natura non facet saltus. Nature does not make jumps. And that's the built-in limitation of Darwinian processes. By default, they're stepwise and gradual. And of course, what I like is that Darwin himself acknowledged this test of evolution himself in the origin. He said, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. And, you know, we're taking them up on that challenge. That's exactly what we're doing here. We're showing evidence that these biological systems and processes could not have arisen by numerous successive slight modifications. Well, in the second and third episodes of our series, we began to take a closer look at the intricate mechanics of eukaryotic cell division. Part two focused on the mitotic spindle, the structure and function of microtubules, and the roles of various motor proteins in the division cycle. And then in part three, we dove into the checkpoints that are built into eukaryotic cell division. In a nutshell, remind us what the checkpoints do. Yeah, so the uh, checkpoints that are involved in eukaryotic cell cycle control uh, ensure that the cell is ready to move into the next phase of the cell cycle. So there is the restriction checkpoint, which determines whether the cell is uh, able to commit to another round of cell division. It's also known as the G1S checkpoint. There's also the uh, DNA damage checkpoint that ensures that the cell is able to progress um, that there's uh, into S phase, that there's no um, damage uh, to, the to the DNA. Uh, there is also the uh, spindle assembly checkpoint, which determines that the cell is ready to progress from metaphase into anaphase. And uh, uh, in particular, um, the microtubules or spindle fibers have to be correctly associated with the kinetochores. Uh, otherwise, it can result in aneuploidy, which is where you have uh, the missegregation of chromosomes resulting in cell the, the daughter cells having the wrong number of chromosomes. And so uh, the spindle assembly checkpoint is very important uh, for, for that purpose. Okay. And today we're going to compare the disparity between prokaryotic cell division and the cell division process in eukaryotes. The Darwinian paradigm would have us believe that the one came from the other. But when you take a close look, there's essentially nothing in common between the two systems. They exhibit different parts and different design logic. Your paper features a two-page table presenting an overview of the differences in cell division mechanisms in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. I found that to be quite helpful. Can you briefly lay out just a few of the key differences that make these two types of cell division so different? Sure. So uh, in eukaryotes, uh, cell division occurs uh, by a process known as mitosis, at least in the case of somatic cells. Um, uh, sex cells use a related process known as meiosis. Uh, but there are a number of different phases in mitotic cell division. So these are uh, prophase, uh, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, uh, telophase. So during prophase, the uh, chromatin condenses into the familiar chromosome structures uh, in which the, the chromatin becomes visible under the microscope. During uh, prometaphase, uh, the nuclear um, membrane disintegrates and breaks into membrane vesicles. The um, kinetochores form also during this stage and become uh, attached to the microtubules that radiate from the centrosomes, uh, also known as the microtubule organizing centers, at the spindle poles. Um, and then during metaphase, the condensed chromosomes line up in the middle of the cell, uh, driven by motor proteins that we've discussed previously, kinesin and dynein, uh, associated with the microtubules. And during anaphase, the chromosomes break up and sister chromatids are pulled to the opposite poles of the cell. And then finally, during uh, telophase, which occurs at the same time as cytokinesis, two daughter nuclei are formed and the chromosomes uh, unravel back into their original expanded chromatin formation. So that's the process of cell division in eukaryotes. Now, the process of cell division in eukaryotes is a universe apart from that mechanism employed in prokaryotic cells, that is in bacterial cells or archaeal cells. They're, they're a universe apart. There's essentially nothing in common, either in terms of the protein components involved or the underlying logic. So... Um, so bacteria, a bacterial cell division um, occurs by a process that's known as binary fission. Uh, so rod bacteria, such as E. coli or salmonella, uh, elongate 
to twice their original length, and this is followed by uh, invagination of the cell membrane and the formation of a septal ring uh, in the middle, and the elongated bacterial cell splits down the middle, forming two daughter cells. Uh, and of course, there are um, except there are variations on this mechanism. So, for example, uh, in Colobacter, uh, no septum is formed, and the division is asymmetrical. But um, the, as, I, as I said, the, the process, the, the underlying logic, as well as the protein components are completely different between the, those two systems. Okay. And in your paper, you sought to determine the extent to which one can identify remote homologs of the eukaryotic cell cycle components among prokaryotes. First, what are homologs? And can you explain in simple terms what you found about the homologs between the two processes? Sure. Um, so homologs are um, uh, prote proteins that are believed to share a common ancestor uh, with another protein and, uh, um, and are often similar uh, in structure or in se amino acid sequence. And what uh, I d determined in my paper is that uh, the vast majority of the components involved in eukaryotic cell division, that is in mitosis, uh, do not have homologs among prokaryotes. Uh, in particular, among uh, the archaea, the archaea, of course, are believed to be um, closer related to eukaryotes than, than bacteria. And in, in particular, among the Asgard archaea, which are is a, is a superphylum of archaea, which is believed to be the closest living archaeal relatives of eukaryotes. Uh, for the vast majority of the components that are involved in eukaryotic cell division, there are no homologs uh, among prokaryotes. And that's surprising, I think, given an evolutionary perspective, because these uh, components that are involved in eukaryotic cell division appear to be uh, eukaryotic de novo innovations that arose after the split between the, uh, ar the archaeal and eukaryotic lineages. Okay. Now, your paper presents a clear challenge to a Darwinian evolutionary pathway for these two self-replication systems. And I want to take a few minutes to unpack that carefully. First, do you find any evidence that these two systems are related through descent with modification? You're saying that, that there's no homologs or homologs. So is there any other evidence that might connect them? No, I actually uh, think that this is a pretty strong argument against the uh, uh, ancestor-dependent relationship of eukaryotes and prokaryotes. Uh, I mean, as I've argued uh, in detail elsewhere, the mechanism of cell division in prokaryotes appears to be irreducibly complex. And as I argued, as in particular in my recent paper and in some recent blog posts on Evolution News, the uh, the process of cell division in eukaryotes appears to be irreducibly complex. And so how do you go from one irreducibly complex system to another irreducibly complex system without passing through any maladaptive intermediate stages, particularly when all of the, or most of the components have to be replaced. Um, and so that's uh, problematic uh, from an evolutionary perspective, going from one irreducibly complex system to another, keeping everything up and running. And cell division, of course, is absolutely fundamental to differential survival. If you don't have uh, self-replicatability, then you have no differential survival and therefore natural selection. And so this is absolutely crucial. Uh, and uh, given the disparity between those two systems, coupled with the fact that both appear to be uh, irreducibly complex, uh, it, it seems to be quite problematic for an evolutionary view. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if they were related and one came from the other, not only would each of the prokaryotic cell division components need to be replaced, but most of the proteins with which they are replaced would need to arise de novo. Now, I want to explain to our listeners what that term means, because it's important here. Tell us what de novo means and why this is a bridge too far for a natural process. Meaning that they arose without uh, ancestors that we can identify. Uh, so they seem to have arisen um, from scratch, essentially, um, after the split between uh, the prokaryotic and eukaryotic lineages. Uh, there are no, as I've said before, there are no homologs for the vast majority of the comp protein components that are found in mitosis, as I discussed in my paper. Um, and so um, you not only have to account for going from one irreducible complex system to another without passing through any maladaptive intermediate stages, but you also have to account for the components 
being completely replaced as well, um, which is just, in my opinion, it strains credulity. Yeah, yeah. So you're saying that the available evidence suggests that the proteins associated with eukaryotic cell division arose after the split between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Why is this important in challenging the claim that both are related? Well, as as I've said, it's a difficult. It's extremely difficult to envision going from one system to the other uh, without passing through any maladaptive intermediate stages, and in particular, um, uh, accounting for where all of these new components arose from by an unguided process, an unguided search. Um, and so you, you not only need to create an entirely new mechanism from scratch, um, and there's essentially no parallel to the mechanism found in prokaryotic cells, but you also have to replace uh, virtually all the components. And the, the few that um, for which you do have homologs in, in prokaryotes, they have to be repurposed as well. So it just, in my opinion, strains credulity that uh, an evolutionary process could account for that transition. Yeah. Well, if undirected processes are incapable of producing the complex machinery associated with mitotic division, is there any other cause that can? Well, I think intelligent design uh, it can account for this, uh, uh, because, uh, can, can account much better for, for this evidence than an evolutionary process because intelligent agents, uh, can they have the capacity for foresight, uh, for, for planning. Uh, and and so forth, and we habitually associate irreducibly complex systems with intelligent agents, uh, with rational, conscious deliberation. And so, when we find uh, these sorts of systems in in biology, then it's not unreasonable, I think, to infer that a mind is involved, uh, in particular in, in the case of such finely uh, uh, engineered and elegant systems such as cell division. Yeah. Now, here's a question. Are you going to continue to study this in detail, or do you think you've reached a level of thoroughness where you, you, you're ready to move on to other things? Oh, absolutely. It's uh, still a topic of particular fascination for me, and I hope to give some presentations, or talks, uh, and uh, maybe even write a book at some point uh, relating to the subject. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll definitely look for that. So where can listeners go to read uh, your coverage of this in detail? I know you've got your paper. Yeah, so there's the paper, which is open access on, in the journal Biocomplexity. There's also my blog post, evolutionnews.org, and of course, this podcast series as well. Okay. And if by chance listeners have a question about something you've said in this series, or they'd like to unpack something with you or follow up with something, uh, can they reach you? Are you, are you reachable? Sure. Uh, my email address is jmcclatchy at discovery.org. Okay. Yeah, so there you have it, listeners. If you want to follow up or you're totally confused and need need uh, Dr. McClatchy to rescue you, we are here. That's what we're doing. We're putting this information out, and we want you to understand it and be able to share it. So whatever we can do to help with that, um, we will. And of course, beyond this series, Jonathan, you and I have had quite a few conversations unpacking numerous biological systems that exhibit evidence of intelligent design. I mean, we've done episodes on muscles, uh, on hearing, our digits. No, not our phone number, but the origin of our fingers and toes. Uh, we did one on the blood clotting cascade, uh, backing up and defending Michael Behe's work. We did a three-part series on sexual reproduction and why it's such a spicy problem for Darwinian evolution. That was fun. And we've looked at the life-friendly properties of water and sunlight. And that doesn't even uh, count our chats about Bayesian reasoning. Bayesian logic and how we can apply it to the cumulative case for intelligent design. So lots of conversations to listen to. You'll find all those episodes and many more at idthefuture.com or by subscribing and looking back um, at the list of episodes on your favorite podcast platform. Well, Jonathan, until next time, I know you're going to be back soon. We've got lots to talk about. You're always putting new ideas out there and new insights. So I'm looking forward to our next chance. Thank you. For ID the Future, I'm Andrew McDermott. Thanks for listening. Visit us at idthefuture.com and intelligentdesign.org. This program is Copyright Discovery Institute and recorded by its Center for Science and Culture.